everyone. Um, welcome and thanks for joining us for the uh, our webinar today about tree protection policy in the Islands Trust. Um, we're just going to give everybody uh, a couple more minutes um, to to log on and join us before starting. Um, yeah, my name is um, Alex McLean, and I'm the tree protection policy intern with Rain Coast this summer. Um, and a law student at uh, University of Victoria. Um, I'm currently located on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Um, if, uh, while we're waiting, if people maybe want to, um, feel free to introduce yourselves and um, who's ter where territories um, you're located on today um, in the chat, um, please uh, feel free to go ahead. And yeah, we'll just uh, take a, uh, just another uh, minute and a bit. Um, okay, um, thanks um, for your patience. Um, I was just, um, for people who join later, I was just um, waiting a couple of minute, minutes uh, to let some more people join before starting. Um, I think I'll get things started now. Um, so yeah, again, thank you um, everyone uh, who's uh, joining us here today for um, coming to our webinar today about uh, tree protection um, in the Islands Trust. Um, and yeah, I should just introduce myself again. My name is Alex McLean, and I'm the Tree Protection Policy Intern here this summer with um, Rain Coast Conservation Foundation. And um, yeah, I'm calling in today from the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And um, I'm excited um, that we'll be joined here today as well um, later for our panel discussion by uh, Deb Morrison, a local trustee for North Pender Island. Um, Adam Olson, MLA for Saanich North and the Islands, and Sheila Anderson, uh, board member for the Galliano Conservancy Association and a former local trustee uh, for Galliano Island. Um, so um, I'll just go over now an a overview of um, the webinar for today. So I'll just start um, giving a brief overview um, uh, presentation with the overview of, of the unique structure of the Islands Trust, and then I'll discuss um, the findings from my summer research on local tree policy in BC and how it might apply in the context of the Islands Trust. Um, and then we will move on to a panel discussion um, with our speakers. Um, so yeah, just to start with the introducing the Islands Trust structure. Um, so the Islands Trust is a federation of local governments for 13 Gulf Islands um, that is responsible for protecting the unique and priceless natural environment in the southern strait of Georgia and Howe Sound. Um, and this includes the incredibly rare and threatened ecosystems of the Coastal Douglas Fir or CDF biogeoclimatic zone. Um, and in recognition of the great importance of protecting the natural environment in this region, the province of British Columbia established the Islands Trust in 1974 under the Islands Trust Act. And the Islands Trust Act gives the Islands Trust a specific legislated mandate to conserve the natural environment uh, of the islands of the trust area. 
So it states, as you can see on the slide, at section three of the Islands Trust Act, that the object of the trust is to preserve and protect the trust area and its unique amenities and environment for the benefit of the residents of the trust area and of British Columbia generally, cooperation with municipalities, regional districts, improvement districts, other persons and organizations, and the government of British Columbia. Um, so to meet its unique conservation mandate, the Islands Trust also has a unique structure. Um, so it is composed of a number of different bodies that together form the local government's system of the trust area and carry out the mandate of the trust. Um, so um, you can see a bit of an overview of the structure um, on this slide here. The Islands Trust area is organized into 13 local trust areas uh, plus one island municipality. Um, uh, which is Bowen Island. Um, so each local trust area, uh, with the exception of Bolanus, Winchelsea, due to its um, small population, um, which is not shown on this graphic, um, elects two representatives who serve as trustees on both the local trust areas, um, respective local trust committee and the trust council. Uh, Bowen Island municipality um, also elects two trustees to trust council from its municipal council. Um, and so in total, there are 26 trustees on trust council. And uh, altogether, trust council is responsible for establishing uh, higher level policies for carrying out the conservation mandate of the trust, um, such as the trust policy statement. Um, and it's also responsible for most of the financial management of the trust. Um, trust Council then elects from its mem among its members a chair and three vice chairs who together form the executive committee. Um, the executive committee oversees the day-to-day -day business of the trust and reviews local bylaws for compliance with the trust policy statement. Um, and land use and development within each local trust area is governed by its respective local trust committee. Um, each local trust committee is composed of the local trust areas two elected trustees plus one member of the executive committee. Um, and the one exception to this is Bolanus uh, Winchelsea, uh, which as I mentioned earlier, doesn't have any elected trustees due to the fact um, that most of its islands are not populated. Um, so instead the uh, executive committee serves at the, as the local trust committee for um, that local trust area. And um, land use and development on Bowen Island uh, are governed by its municipal council. Um, which also has um, many uh, uh, capabilities beyond um, that of a local trust committee because of it's an island municipality instead of a local trust committee. Um, but it's uh, bylaws in relation to land use and development still have to comply with the object of the trust and with the trust policy statement. Um, so the last component um, of the island's trust structure is the island's trust conservancy. Um, the Conservancy has a six-member board um, consisting of one member, of the executive committee, two other members of trust council, and three provincially appointed members. Um, the Islands Trust, uh, the Conservancy has an important role to play in land use, um, planning and decisions in the Islands Trust, um, as it's the only branch whose staff has expertise in uh, specific expertise in ecology and biology, um, which is a really important complement to the urban planning expertise um, of most Islands Trust staff in the context of, of the Islands Trust's um, environment uh, mandate. Um, so I have a bit more of a summary of the structure here. Um, and um, yeah, so um, now to move on to uh, the my tree bylaw report. Um, yeah, so um, because of the, the unique uh, mandate and structure of the Islands Trust is crucial for um, limiting the rampant development common to municipalities and for carrying out the trust's mandate to preserve and protect uh, the natural environment of the trust area. Um, but despite the fact that it was created with an explicit uh, conservation mandate, um, the Islands Trust actually lacks some important conservation policy tools that have been granted to municipalities. Um, so today we're going to focus on one key policy tool that the Islands Trust currently lacks, which is the ability to pass comprehensive tree bylaws to regulate tree damaging and removal on private lands. Um, 
So because of the potential importance of tree bylaws for enabling the Islands Trust to carry out its preserve and protect mandate effectively, um, one of my main projects with Raincoast this summer has been to research local trust, local tree policy in BC um, and author a report um, exploring how these policies and regulations uh, could be uh, potentially implemented in the Islands Trust. Um, so for this report, I built a database of every uh, municipal and regional district tree bylaw in BC uh, to determine best practices and to outline um, lessons that the Islands Trust could learn from other jurisdictions. Um, and another main focus of the report is on jurisdictional issues which currently prevent the Islands Trust from passing comprehensive tree bylaws and, and what needs to change to enable better tree and forest protection in the trust area. Um, so first I'll just um, or a summary of my findings on the tree bylaw best practices. Um, so first is to say generally about tree bylaws. Um, so no tree bylaw protects all trees, um, you know, from, from ever be, being removed or anything like that, but um, rather they, they designate uh, specific trees that fit within a certain criteria as, as protected trees, um, and then require a permit to cut, remove, or otherwise damage those trees. Um, and in addition to tree protection, tree bylaws can also be used to set requirements for replacement of removed trees or set minimum standards for canopy cover on properties within uh, the region. And the strength of um, tree bylaws varies a lot between different municipalities. Um, and so these are some of the key components that uh, impact how strong the tree protection and the regulations are. Um, from my findings. Um, so you can see them on the slide here. Um, first one is um, just the spatial scope of where the tree ball law actually applies. So some municipalities, um, and in most of them, um, it applies to the entire municipality, but um, some only protect trees within like specific areas um, within the municipality that are like, designated as tree protection areas. Um, Another element is um, how protected trees is actually defined. So um, typically they will set um, a minimum size um, for a tree to be a protected tree, um, uh, which will either be based on like the minimum height of a tree or minimum um, diameter at breast height. Um, and so obviously more uh, protection is going to be offered when the minimum size uh, to qualify as a protected tree is, is smaller. And then the more comprehensive bylaws will also um, typically add um, additional protections um, for trees, even if they don't, uh, for certain trees, even if they don't meet the minimum size, um, such as, for example, protecting um, all trees, uh, trees of any size or trees of even a very small size if they're of a um, certain species that the uh, local government has identified as particularly important for conservation, or if they're located in an environmentally sensitive area or conservation area, or if they're um, wildlife trees, and so on. Um, and then, you know, third um, main element is the permitted reasons for removal. So, um, as I mentioned, tree bylaws will uh, allow you to um, remove protected trees if you uh, acquire a permit. And so, um, you know, the extent that uh, trees are actually protected is going to vary a lot based on uh, how easy or difficult it is to acquire a tree removal permit. Um, so more comprehensive ones will um, only protect, only allow um, uh, people to obtain permits for um, more, uh, narrow reasons such as like safety reasons um, for removing, you know, dead, dying, or, or dangerous or hazardous trees. Um, they're also required by provincial legislation to allow uh, certain types of removals, such as um, any tree removal that's uh, required as part of uh, any land use or a density that's permitted um, under the applicable zoning bylaw. Um, as well as some other things such as um, agricultural 
they can't um, regulate certain agricultural uses and things like that. Um, and then in other um, municipalities um, where they have uh, less protection, they will only protect trees um, or they will only uh, refuse to issue a permit um, if they think that the removal isn't safe or um, they will have like a really broad list of reasons for removal such as um, just like minor inconvenience or aesthetic preference or things like that. Um, and then, um, yeah, one more element is uh, setting a minimum target for trees, um, their tree density or canopy cover um, across all lots. This is something that not um, too many um, uh, tree bylaws have, but um, in my research, it is something that's very uh, been strongly recommended by a lot of policy experts. And it's something that is seemingly um, becoming more common. For example, I, I believe Central Saanich and Victoria, just in like the past month, both um, revamped their, their tree bylaws to, to add this component to it. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention is um, compatibi compatibility with land use regulations. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, in the provincial legislation, um, specifically it's section 50 of the community charter, um, does not allow a municipal, municipal tree bylaw to um, prevent development to, of any uh, permitted land use or density under the zoning bylaw. So it's very important um, for zoning bylaws to be aligned with the tree bylaw so that it can be um, actually enforced um, and for example, with things like required uh, replacement trees or hitting that uh, tree density target, um, that won't be enforceable if the zoning bylaw doesn't leave enough space on a property um, to actually plant all of those trees. Um, so yeah, so I'll move on now to um, my jurisdictional findings. So, um, yeah, not every local government has the same jurisdiction to uh, regulate trees um, or has access to all of the same tools. So um, municipalities have uh, a more comprehensive uh, ability to, to regulate trees um, through section 83C of the community charter, um, which grants them uh, broad jurisdiction over tree regulation. Um, regional districts have a much narrower ability to regulate trees through Section 500 of the Local Government Act, um, which allows them to regulate tree cutting only in areas that it considers may be subject to flooding, erosion, landslip, or avalanche. Um, and then Section 291B of the Islands Trust Act grants local trust committees uh, and the Islands Trust the same ability that regional districts have under Section 500 of the Local Government Act. Um, so, so they have the same uh, jurisdiction as, as regional districts. Um, but um, it turns out only, only two regional districts and zero local trust communities currently use um, this uh, jurisdiction that they have over uh, tree regulation. And um, while limited, uh, local trust communities, committees, current jurisdiction to regulate trees does still have um, some potential that's worth exploring. So just for example, um, here's a map of the, um, uh, from the Sunshine Coast Regional District's uh, tree cutting bylaw um, for the uh, electoral area of Elphinstone. So the areas in green and yellow are the areas that um, the, the tree cutting bylaw applies to. And so these are, again, like the areas that it considers to be like hazardous areas. And um, so just for comparison, um, I uh, took these maps from the official community plans for South Pender Island um, on the left and Gamier Island on the right. And um, these are maps um, that the official community plans um, identify as, as hazardous areas. And so, um, it's very um, possible or very quite likely that uh, the local trust committees could uh, pass a tree cutting bylaw that applies to these highlighted uh, areas of their respective islands, um, even with their current jurisdiction. Um, and so um, if they were to 
um, for, for local trust communities to be able to have the same jurisdiction and the same uh, tools that are currently available to municipalities for tree regulation, um, the Islands Trust Act uh, would have to be amended to grant local trust communities all the same abilities as a municipality under Section uh, 8.3c of the Community Charter. Um, further provincial uh, legislative reform would also be required um, for local trust communities uh, to be able to fine those who violate their tree bylaws to the same level that most municipalities do. Um, so the Offense Act, um, which is how uh, local governments use to pursue um, long form prosecution against people who violate their bylaws, it sets a maximum fine, the sort of default maximum fine is $2,000 per offense. Um, but section uh, 263 of the community charter um, increases this max the maximum fine that can be uh, imposed to $50,000 for municipalities. And um, most tree bylaws in BC have a maximum fine that is uh, quite a bit higher than $2,000. Um, but um, uh, yeah, there's no comparable provision for uh, local trust communities to be able to go beyond that uh, $2,000 threshold. Um, yeah, and, and then also worth mentioning is that the, so local trust communities um, bylaws require executive community approval for all of their bylaws, um, um, where the executive community has to find all their bylaws uh, consistent with the trust policy statement, which is drafted by trust council. Um, so um, it also be very important to ensure that uh, the trust policy statement is consistent with um, allowing tree bylaws. And in fact, um, it's some, uh, the trust policy statement is currently under review and this could be a good opportunity to um, amend the TPS so that it even guides local trust committees towards strengthening tree protection um, by using the jurisdiction that they currently have. Um, and um, one final thing I wanted to mention on jurisdictional issues is um, so because of the um, unique conservation mandate of the Islands Trust and um, the great ecological significance of the natural environment in the trust area, um, you, the trust should arguably have really even greater jurisdiction to protect trees than municipalities do. Um, and so um, one significant area that um, the Environmental Law Center has identified um, that um, is sort of a, a hole in municipalities' is, um, ability to uh, regulate and protect trees is that um, they cannot apply bylaws to um, that, that regulate um, private managed forest land um, because of section 21 of the Private Managed Forest Land Act, um, which prevents local governments from adopting any bylaw that has the effect of restricting forest management activities on those lands. And so this is something that could be amended um, to make an exception for the Islands Trust to allow them to regulate um, private managed forest land to um, you know, further be able to protect trees and to carry out their um, preserve and protect mandate. Um, this is something that the Islands Trust has already made um, multiple pushes for, but I just want to raise that again. Um, so yeah, that is um, the summary of uh, of my findings. Um, so thank you all for joining us and for listening. And so now we'll um, move on um, to um, introducing um, our speakers. So I'm going to um, add you, Sheila, and Adam to the, the stream. That's all right. So. Um, I think we're still um, waiting on Deb, I guess. Um, but um, yeah, hello, Sheila and Adam. Um, and thank you both very much for, for, uh, for joining us today. Um, I've been added to the conversation since Deb has, uh, is not with us right now. So I will okay. be sure to. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Shauna, for stepping in for Deb. Um, yes, go ahead. 
Oh, sorry. I thought you. <laughs> My apologies. Okay, so sorry. Um, so just to start off, I thought I'd maybe ask. Uh, maybe I could start with um, Sheila, since you are a former uh, trustee on uh, Galliano Islands Local Trust Committee and on the Trust Council. Um, uh, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about um, how the Islands Trust currently attempts uh, to protect trees and um, how, I guess, significant it is that it can't currently pass these um, comprehensive tree protection bylaws. Okay, well, um, I guess the first thing to keep in mind is that every island is, is different in their bylaws and their own OCPs that guide you know, their own policies. They all are supposed to be in the umbrella of the trust policy statement, but they are unique and they their own uh, OCPs and bylaws react to their issues with forestry and just how their islands have developed and as well. So keeping that in mind, um, like I'm, I, I'm from Galliano, I've lived here for 40 plus years and I've lived through um, living here when half the island was managed for us, held by one owner, and seeing that change um, and how very suddenly our island was faced with half of the island being clear cut, more or less all of it, but some pockets were left, and then sold to private owners who then many of them proceeded to log again and take pockets that had been left. So it was a dramatic change to see so much forest clear cut um, in very few years. So that has is sort of what in on Galliano, our response was um, to develop uh, policies and bylaws that would help us cope with this land use change that was sort of launched onto us and also try and do it in such a way that in the, the end result, and it could take many, many decades to get there, would be that when that forest grew back, we would not see that happen again. And so we've, we've done everything we, we could, but in terms of what Galliano has done, um, I can speak sort of better to that than what has happened on other islands, is we knew we couldn't have a tree cutting um, bylaw, but we, and we did our best to, and did develop a development permit area for tree cutting, which covers the whole island, not just the forest land, but it's very geared to commercial tree removal. And there's a lot of exemptions, which, you know, as you mentioned in your report, um, Alex, that exempt, like if a, a, a residential lot is being developed and the house being built, they, they can clear the area for the house. There's no question. Um, permitted uses that are zoned cannot cannot be stopped by this tree cutting development permit. So it's really been geared to the type of logging or, or tree cutting that involves a timber mark, which is required when timber is taken from one parcel of land and carried somewhere else, sold, milled, whatever. So um, it, what we have is limited to also to over a certain amount of cutting per hectare. So it's, an, it's a way of trying to ensure that any logging that is done is done at a sustainable rate for that property. And it's not as pinpoint as each tree that you want to cut it's more looking at okay are you trying to cut more than I think it's 12 cubic meters per hectare over three years if you are you need to take out a permit and prove how this cutting is part of an, a bigger plan of sustainable forestry for this property now you mentioned the PMFL of course so that DP doesn't apply on PMFL properties. Not all of our forest zoned land is in the PMFL, but a considerable amount is. So, um, but that was the only mechanism we could find at the time that could be applied. And I have to mention 
I think Denman had done one too, but theirs got thrown out. This was some years ago. But ours was linked to the need for forest cover in our groundwater catchment and absorption. So it's it's linked to the, the resource of our groundwater, which is very fundamental. And I think that's why our DP has stood. But since most of the trees in the forest land had already been cut, um, there hasn't been that much commercial logging. Um, I know of maybe one or two DPs taken out for, for logging on forest land, but um, not, not much. But in the future, there could be more. But it isn't easy, and it is a little bit, I sense, I'll just say this, it's been a, it's a challenge for the Islands Trust to deal with because they don't have any experts on hand in regards to forestry. You know, they have planners who aren't experts in that field. In fact, one senior planner told me he didn't know what it meant um, to um, need a timber mark. So I don't know how he could interpret the development permit area without knowing that. So, you know, I, I think that's an area where it's been very frustrating because I think um, it, there's been a few cases of that DP area for tree cutting on Galliano kind of misapplied, which upsets people because, you know, they didn't think it was going to do that, but it's been misapplied just because there's a lack of understanding of, of how it's supposed to be applied. <laughs> anyway, I, I may have gone off topic of your question, but is there anything else? <laughs> no, thank you. That was great. Yeah. And I think that, um, yeah, the, I, the the expertise is definitely something that would be important. There was a tree bylaw as well for knowing how to properly evaluate um, whether it's um, you know what the best practices are for removing trees and things like that, and and what um, how many trees can um, actually like fit on a property um, when a tree bylaw like requires certain trees, um, and for being able to assess things like all oh, trees actually dangerous and things like that. So that's definitely a concern. And I think also, um, just to add on to what you were saying about the Galliano Island development permit area um, uh, that covers the whole island to um, protect trees, I think that, um, in my view at least, that sort of speaks to how the um, Islands Trust and how local trust communities kind of lack appropriate tools in a way because a development permit area um like it's the best as you said it's kind of the best option or maybe the only option that local trust communities kind of have for protecting trees in that way but um um you know from my research my understanding is they're not development permit area is not really meant to be um where the the intention of that policy tool is kind of for um tailoring um very like specific um regulations to like a particular um, area within a jurisdiction. And um, I think it's interesting in a way that that they're using uh, a development permit area almost as um, a kind of like de facto tree bylaw almost where they're using it kind of in the way of how a tree bylaw would um, apply. But, um, and in my understanding as well is that it's, it's a lot more difficult to enforce a development permit um, than it is to enforce a tree bylaw where you can just um, fine um, somebody for violating uh, the tree bylaw with a, with a development permit. They have to um, seek like a court injunction or something like that a lot of the time, which can be very expensive um, for a local trust community. But um, anyways, um, I see that Deb has yes. now joined. So thank you for, um, uh, thank you for being here. Um, and yeah, maybe, um, uh, could I ask um, you, Deb, the same um, sort of question that I asked Sheila about what um, local trust communities are currently and what the Islands Trust is currently doing um, to try and protect trees um, within its current jurisdiction? Um, and maybe um, Sheila spoke more to the Galliano context and maybe you'd be able to focus more on the North Bender context. Sure. And um, just check my audio. Am I good? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry for the delay in being here. Um, so it's interesting because I think the question is slightly different. It's what are we doing to protect forests? 
Um, and individual trees, when we name it as a tree bylaw, it becomes very contentious in many communities um, because people are worried about trees falling on their house. They're worried about like the ability to cut an individual tree here or there. And really the intent, as far as I understand it, for most of the work that's been done in the region is really to protect contiguous healthy forest ecosystems. Absolutely. And so that's what we really want to do. Um, so, and that is a challenge, just like Sheila's named in terms of the, you know, different um, jurisdictions that are within the trust and what tools we have as the Islands Trust um, to do that. So, you know, there is definitely advocacy efforts in place to think about how do we get some of those additional powers for tree and forestry management um, into the trust potentially, or, or like at least more cohesively somewhere um, would be helpful. The development permit strategy is definitely something that has been done. Um, and it's interesting because I don't think it's been done to the full extent it could be done um, because the development permits are part of the Local Government Act, um, and we get our authority from that, not from the Dylans Trust Act. So ironically, it's actually the Local Government Act that's giving us the authority to do this, not the Islands Trust Act. Um, and they are, uh, they can be used for things like protecting natural environment, ecosystem, biological diversity. They can be used in a way that I haven't seen them used here locally for the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. So does that mean sequestration? Could we argue that? You know, like that would be an interesting thing to argue um, because rural areas are actually one of the biggest things that we can do related to climate change is actually sequestration, right? Because we have a small population. So we want to be pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. Forests are a great way to do that. So um, I think there are a few other things that could be tried still that haven't yet. Um, and some of the LTCs are starting to work on those, starting to try and figure out what would that look like um, and learn from each other. Um, and I know that the trust holistically is also working on this. Um, the last one I think that is potentially has a really good chance of having a more immediate effect is the way in which we actually acknowledge our reconciliation responsibilities and understand the cultural value of forests um, and protect them for that goal. Um, because that has, there's much more integration with the idea of holistic forest management inside sort of potentially intersecting with reconciliation efforts on in different locations. So that may be a, a more viable way forward as we start to think about um, forest protection as a part of cultural resource protection. So um, there's a few different pathways, I think, that are possible. The, possibly the most frustrating about all of those pathways is not one of them is directly like forests need to be protected holistically, um, except through um, provincial powers that we don't have in the trust right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. And yeah, thank you um, in particular for bringing up the uh, cultural significance of trees for um, First Nations, um, that's something that's definitely really important to, to recognize um, how yeah, the conservation work of the Islands Trust um, relates to um, the fact that the Islands Trust is on uh, you know, indigenous territories. Um, it's something that's always important to um, consider. And so, um, yeah, as you um, mentioned, uh, the provincial powers, maybe this is a good um, Segue way to uh, turn um, to, to Adam. Um, and um, Adam, I was wondering if um, you could speak to um, your efforts. I know that um, you've um, spoken in a provincial legislature um, about um, expanding the, the Islands Trust's um, abilities around um, trees. And um, I was wondering if you could talk about um, where the uh, what the province's, I guess, response has been to this um, sort of um, push and from uh, efforts from the Islands Trust to to gain those powers and um, yeah, uh, to what the province's role um, is in protecting um, trees on the Islands Trust. Well, I think that it's important to name the fact that all of these laws have been designed with the premise that we cut trees in this province. So, 
you know, I think that one of the fundamental flaws that the provincial government has in, in and we and we see it as a result of the of the patchwork of legislation and rules uh, applied here and not there and and you know this power granted to municipal governments and not granted to Islands Trust or you know is, is that the perspective of our of of our government going back to the very moment that the colony was established and those first boats started to show up on the coast to see the grand old trees that we had here was we need to get those down as quickly as possible before anybody sees that we're getting them down and, and that's really been the perspective uh, you know you know that's my perspective of the way the provincial government has related to uh trees and it's largely how it relates to how the provincial government relates to nature just in general and i think you know i would i would not i mean i definitely as an indigenous person who grew up in chocolate and is a Satanist person um, recognize the relationship that we have culturally with trees, I would say that it's probably better characterized as we have a different world view in how to relate to nature just overall. It doesn't matter whether it's a tree or it's a shellfish or it's a, you know, the, from the tiniest little critters to the biggest ones um, and to the oldest ones. Uh, the relationship with nature uh, is different. Um, you don't really see in Satanist law a patch or in, in Satanist governance, a patchwork of laws where you're kind of just kind of snaking around the issue. The issue, the, the Senchothan language is particularly direct, almost so that it's blunt to the point where you would think that the person is getting angry with you. And no, they're not getting angry with you. They're just being direct. And I think that one of the challenges that we have provincially is how indirect all of this is. The PMFL and, and you know the the notion of of amending the PMFL to uh, grant the islands trust. The PMFL is is actually a law in its essence is to protect a whole bunch of values that we're talking about needing to protect, and and written right in is soil conservation, water quality conservation, fish and riparian conservation. These are all if the act is being delivered as it should be. These are all values that need to be. Uh, considered, and they're all values that we would be needing to consider with respect to, um, you know, and, and that's for forestry management and tree management. I would draw a distinction between forestry management mm -hmm. and management of trees. Uh, um, there, you know, there's commercialization, and then there's the 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 discussion about trees on on people's property. Um, you know, and I think that I was a formerly uh, a municipal councillor in Central Saanich, and we used the tree bylaw uh, in a very specific case, but on a on a regular basis. Um, and we, we didn't have experts either uh, in Central Saanich, but the experts are available. It, it, it's not, an, I don't think that it's an excuse to say, well, there's no experts in the Islands Trust, so therefore it's not a power that should be granted to it. Um, there are ways in order for that expertise to be brought in. And, and I'm not saying you said that, Sheila, I'm just sorry if that's what you're saying. That's what's been said before. I, I just think that there are ways to bring that expertise within to uh, whether at a, uh, on a case by case basis or on, um, uh, or to, to bring some expertise uh, into it. And so, uh, you know, I think that from my perspective, um, that I've heard a lot about whether or not the Islands Trust should be the body that regulates this or if it's, and I look at it and I say, we need to provide, uh, as, as a provincial government, we need to provide a comprehensive set of tools to local government who we ask to do uh, through our legislation, a bunch of them have been mentioned, it starts with the community charter, then it goes to the local government act, then it goes to the Islands Trust Act. Uh, and in the Islands Trust area, those are a comprehensive set of, of uh, laws and regulations that guide the decisions that are made. It doesn't matter, in my opinion, what you think or what your opinion of the Islands Trust is or the job that they have done. They are the body that is to govern the islands. And each island, as has been pointed out uh, with Sheila, is very different and has very different governance and very different bylaws and different official community plans. And that's to reflect the unique nature of each of the communities that I represent in the Southern Gulf Islands and the overall uh, Federation of Islands uh, in the Salish Sea. And so, um, you know, I, I think that uh, I've brought forward a, 
a, a simple amendment that could, I think, a lot, it's not, it's, it's on the order papers. It hasn't been brought forward likely in the, this coming fall to indicate the severity of, the, of, of this issue. But there are a variety of issues that could be addressed uh, that the provincial government needs to have the will to address with the Islands Trust to ensure that the goal that you highlighted, Alex, at the very beginning of this to preserve and protect, there's the adequate tools in the toolbox for the island's trustees, the current governance structure that we have uh, to manage tree cutting or to manage any variety of issues when it relates to nature and, and relationships with surrounding communities, including the indigenous nations. And that Patrick right now has let us down. Mm -hmm. uh, as has, and in fact, I think uh, uh, Patrick of Laws, I'd say, as has the fact that um, most of the islands have now been zoned under the current patchwork, mm -hmm. meaning that it has, for without a full comprehensive set of tools in the toolbox, and then all of the islands being zoned uh, on top of that, has now put islands trust uh, trustees and local trust councils and the overall governance of this in a more challenging situation because you're not starting with a fresh slate you're starting with a slate that has is substantially confusing and 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 is a, a patchwork in and of itself of zones and and um so uh it's it, i think i think where the provincial government needs to be more supportive of the islands trust is and, and more collaborative is that this is not a this is this isn't a situation where you create the law and you say, okay, we're done here. Now deal with the, the gaps and the openings as they are and, and just work your way around it or work your way through it. We have to be, have uh, an, an open mind to making amendments to the acts in order to achieve what it is that we're hoping to achieve. And so I'm through, through a, a private member's bill, I'm trying to draw awareness to a situation that the Islands Trust uh, trustees have raised um, and as well, a recognition of the fact that uh, this is uh, any amendments to provide powers to the Islands Trust doesn't mean that necessarily the behavior or the outcome is going to change tomorrow. This is now a discussion that would be able to be had in the community in an appropriate way. And so as an example, I think uh, Galliano is as unique an island of the five islands that I have when it comes to the relationship with trees, the experience that Sheila uh, highlighted, very, very different from what's going on on Pender and very, very different about the history and what's gone on on Salt Spring. And so that unique relationship is able to play out uh, if we empower the local government body uh, that we've empowered to do this with the tools that they need to, and then they can have that local conversation in the unique way that, that they will have it. Uh, and, you know, I, I think what's important to, I think, I think stem some of the tide that might be coming in here on this, and that is that, well, we don't like the Islands Trust. Well, that's not the conversation that we're having, but it's not a, it's a conversation that we might want to have, but it's not the conversation that needs to be had in terms of protecting trees or putting in place the tools for a specific, even if you remove trees from it, a specific activity trees or roads or what, whatever it is. And so I'm, I'm quite prepared to have multiple conversations about the Islands Trust on an ongoing basis. What I'm not prepared to accept is a patchwork of, of rules and a patchwork of regulations that leave really important values vulnerable, including mm -hmm. water and, and go to the PMFL, including soil conservation, erosion, the impact between, you know, ultimately when it comes down to local government, it's the impact between neighbors mm -hmm. and the relationship, the managing po uh, property lines. The tools need to be there for islands trustees to be able to manage those property lines. And so when you've got a situation where, you know, one property will cut to the property line, impacting erosion and water quality and um, riparian uh, areas on neighboring properties, that's hugely problematic and carries a huge amount of liability. So uh, there's obviously, a, I could talk about this for a while, there's obviously a lot that is packed into this. Uh, however, I, I believe that we need to be providing the current local government structure that we have established, the tools that they need in order to be able to, um, to 
to make the decisions that need to be made on behalf of the constituents that they represent and that you know in deb's case uh and in uh and in jane wolverton's case as an example we share those constituents they're mm -hmm. Saanich north and the islanders and so uh, that's that's the place that i'm very interested in and, and i represent half of the islands within the within the federation within uh one riding so um it's particularly pronounced and acute in Saanich north and the islands and if i can just add one thing to what adam's saying so it is so critical that we have this more holistic planning lens um, that we're, we're actually planning for these multiple aspects of the environment. Trees are not separate from water, like Sheila said. Trees are not separate from riparian management. They're not separate from erosion. Um, and so the fact that we have no way to really think as communities and a plan um, for those integrated sort of environmental impacts is really challenging. Um, and there are a lot of changes underway inside the Island Trust to be able to make those processes smoother, but we are hitting a number of things like tree and forestry management that are outside of the control of the Trust and complicate the work of the Trust. Not to say it's perfect, I would never be the one to say that. Um, and, and one thing I would add to the list that Adam gave of those impacts is the drying of the islands. In the southern islands here, you know, removal of vast areas of forest are radically drying the islands and the aquifers and, and our ability to store water. And like, we need to be really, really careful. And so like Sheila said, linking those to aquifer management is our strategy here. Um, we've just done a big water study in the Southern Gulf Islands to be able to think about how we link in forestry management and retention to aquifer regeneration. But, you know, that, the, that those data sets take some time to get in place. And really, we should be a little more precautionary. If I, if I may just add one thing, I want to acknowledge the email. Oh, go ahead, Sheila. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I, I just wanted to sort of in add to um, Deb's comments and yours, Adam, um, that, you know, I think what Adam, you're describing is, is needed is to smooth this whole interconnection of the island's trust with it, its, its role with other government agencies and, and have everything work more smoothly. But the cooperation spoken to in the trust object it hasn't really been there. I guess I put it that way. And it's not just forestry, it's also energy and mines and Monty. But just um, as a quick fix, I, I, I imagine this could be a quick fix. If the PMFL, and this would only affect some lands, but if they adopted an attitude that their forest management plans that are required of the people in it had to be sustainable, plans for forestry and and not um, and, and therefore take into all those values soil and moisture absorption and tree cover and sustaining the forest not just their pocketbooks so you know I, I think that could be one one thing that could be done while all these other areas are worked on to overall improve the trust's abilities to function and and as Deb says the trust themselves are looking at improving these these um, functions within their organization um, but these things do take time and it's 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 just so frustrating I think for people who live in these areas when things do take so long and time and time again you know forests are lost or they're fragmented and um, and they they never come back but I do think to the local trust committees, do have a, a tool at their disposal, which is basically managed development. So it's not fragmenting unnecessarily large tracts of forest land and that it's not strip development along the shore and leaves intact forests reaching the shore. And just, you know, there are in, in how they manage any development proposals um, can have a huge influence in, in in the health of the forests that remain. That's all. No, that's that's a. a I appreciate that. And I I would just want to add to the to to this that I think the uh, patchwork of laws that and and as Sheila raises 
an amendment to the PMFL, that would impact the lands of the owners that have put their lands within the PMFL, meaning anybody who hasn't taken that extraordinary step to, to join uh, and to, to agree to be regulated under that act uh, are outside of it. And so you could have lands directly adjacent to each other that are, are regulated uh, through a, a couple of different sets of laws. One, a law, and the other could be unregulated. And so um, the, those consistent, and, and so this is where I want to acknowledge an email that I received talking about kind of the history about forestry and tree cutting on one of the islands and the relationships and the, and the, between government and individuals, between longstanding community members and, and et cetera. And I think what's important to, to just name straight out here is that as the elected officials over the years have been trying to navigate their way through this patchwork, it's actually created outcomes within community that are totally undesirable. Relationships between people that, that have eroded now over time that were totally unnecessary, that if we were forthright about what it was that we were trying to achieve and provided the, uh, the, the regulatory, the, the legal and regulatory framework uh, that didn't require this kind of navigation through to, to get an outcome of, to protect a value that the community uh, has. Um, and this is, where, this is where our patchwork of laws is letting communities down and people down and neighbors down. Because it's, because, it, you know, there's a lot of tension around this and there's a, there's a lot of people who's, who, who are watching this closely because of, because of the value that they're interested in. And yet what I, what I really hope that we can get to is a situation where you have a local government uh, body that has the tools that it needs and can have an open and honest conversation with the mm -hmm. constituency mm -hmm. and say, what do we value and what do we want? And if you come up with the val if you come up with that plan, we've got the tools in our toolbox to be able to do that rather than, mm -hmm. oh, we can't do this or we can't do that or you have to talk to mm -hmm. them or you have to talk to them. It's really, really challenging. Mm -hmm. hmm. yeah, yeah, thank you um, all for sharing. I also, I also yeah. yes, thank you. Thank you for um, your efforts. Could I just say as well that I think the trust itself are undergoing a governance re review. And I think it's very, very important that they look very closely at how the policies and OCPs, which stem from the trust policy and the bylaws in each island that stem from the policies in the OCP are actually fully recognized and seriously, seriously, every attempt to carry them out when a land use decision is before an LCC. And some islands don't have that many land use decisions before them. Others have many and a lot of pressure. So it, it, there's, in my opinion, that's a problem in the trust as well when the, you can have all the policies you want in your OCP. But if they're not taken seriously by the, the staff and the, the local trustees and the chairs, um, then they just get sort of pushed aside. So all that, you know, a community plan work that, that many members mm -hmm. of a community could participate in just is wasted. And that builds such an um, mm -hmm. apathy, an apathy in, mm -hmm. in communities when hours and hours of volunteer time and studying and learning and taking all this all this knowledge we have and trying to apply it to a good outcome. And then when it comes down to a land use decision, there's so much pressure on, on say, to remedy um, uh, someone who's in, been in violation for years to, to just get it fixed, get it in compliance, get it off the table that all these policies are just ignored. So mm -hmm. I, this is where I, I also see a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'll just, I just wanted mm -hmm. to mention that. Thank you, Sheila. And thank you, um, um, Sheila, Adam, and Deb all for, for sharing um, all of your knowledge and your experiences with us. Um, it's been such a great discussion. I wish, um, 
we have more time to, to continue, but um, it is 1 uh, p.m. now, so I don't want to um, keep any of you um, longer than you committed to. So um, I think we'll have to wrap it up there. So thank you all um, so much for joining us, um, both in the audience. And um, yeah, thank you so much to Sheila, Adam, and Deb for um, being part of this. Um, we really appreciate um, taking time to, to speak uh, speak with us here today. Uh, so, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Take care.